Aha. Hello, everybody. I have a slight technical difficulty that uh, I need to try fix. This needs to be reset. Give me one second. I'll try to get. And you guys know I can't do without my little clicker. So happy holidays, everybody. Happy Easter for those who celebrated. Happy weekend for others. We've got an interesting show today. This is where we go through the top questions of the week. And uh, let's just jump in. I think everything's working. So we're going to be talking about uh, a very interesting one, actually, DCAing into Bitcoin versus going to college or even putting in money away while you're in college. We're going to look about at uh, the Bitcoin layer twos. We're going to decide between hard and soft wallets, deep dive into Polkadot, uh, my top equities, a little bit about AI and trading. I said something last week that disturbed many people, and I'll explain why. So let's jump in. Of course, this is not financial advice. And the questions come from Patreon. A big thank you to everybody in Patreon that puts these together every single week. And it's great because I also learn from this exercise too. So let's go. This one is super, super interesting. And I found this one personally fascinating, and I thought about it for quite some time. So let me go through it. This is from Sir Larry Wildman. My 17-year-old daughter will be attending university in the UK. She works part-time and just started investing 20, 20 pounds, British pounds per month of her wages into Bitcoin. By, tw how, by 2027, how much will her investment be worth? And will the return cover the predicted student loan of 70K for a four-year degree? And how would you explain to her that the opportunity cost of spending 70k, making friends for life, getting an education, etc., which no one can take away, versus investing in Bitcoin? So there's a lot of stuff here. And I can't predict where Bitcoin will be by 2027. I do have, uh, I can, you know, to, from the macro situation of what's happening to money and money printing and everything else. It's pretty safe to say that Bitcoin will be somewhere between six hundred thousand dollars and a million dollars by 2030, 2032, That time frame, I think that's pretty easy to estimate. But by twenty twenty seven, hard to say. Four years from now. But what I can do is run some numbers as to what would happen if we put the clock back four years. And I can also give you some evidence that many people believe, because of the scarcity of Bitcoin and the network effect and the adoption we could easily see what we saw last bull run. So therefore, you can take everything today and just tweak it for the actual numbers and amounts. So first of all, what we're going to do is, uh, well, congratulations to your 70-year-old daughter for going to college. Let's imagine instead of 20 British pounds a month, let's imagine we invested $100 a month for the last four years. If somebody were to do that, you would, and I'll calculate the exact British pound amount as well in a minute, but just for the audience here to wrap their heads around, DCAing in $100 a month into Bitcoin from basically the last four years, the last 200 weeks and change. We would have spent about $5,200 and we'd have about 0 0.4 Bitcoin. If we did DCA in steroids, we would have spent a little bit more, $6,300, we'd have 0.626. Bitcoin, call it 0.63 Bitcoin. And the ROI, of course, using uh, this model is 176.7% versus 120.7%. Remember, the last four years, you take into account all of the stuff that happened, the big run up, fall down, run up, fall down. And that is the nature of this beast. And that's why we built the model to optimize the DCA process. Now, let's get back to your questions. First of all, if we imagine British pound, uh, I looked at the the pound versus dollar chart over the last four years. The red line is a 200 day moving average. Right now it's about $1.19 per pound. The average we can assume though, going back the last four years is about $1.25. So that's what I assumed for this because you've got multiple fluctuations. You've got the fluctuation in the price of Bitcoin to the dollar and Bitcoin to the pound. So it's very important to take that. I was going to throw up a Bitcoin British pound chart, but I don't want to confuse this too much. We'll keep it simple. So let's go back. DCA, British pounds, 20 pounds per month. Over the last four years, again, can't predict the future, uh, uh, but many believe we'll have that 3x flow as well. And by the way, just to remind you what that 3x flow is, and I've spoken to many experts on this, that is 
last cycle we went from the previous all-time highs, 20k, went to 67, 69k. Many people believe that 3x is possible again, which would take us to 180k. I think that's a little bit generous, but uh, the adoption is pretty rampant. So if we did do bridge pound twenty dollars, twenty pounds a month, that's twenty five dollars a month. DC after four years would be 0 0.08 Bitcoin, and DCAS after four years would be 0 0.1 Bitcoin, which is not bad. Um, it's definitely something, but it would not cover the cost of education, not by any stretch. That's about seventy thousand pounds over four years versus 0 0.1 multiplied by the current price today, call it 28,000. So you got 2,800. It's not a spit in the bucket, as they say. But I like the way you're thinking. But let's go a little bit deeper. Let's turn this around and imagine, not advising this at all, but imagine you took that 70,000 pounds four years ago, you divided it by 200 weeks, and you DCA'd in. Well, then it would be a very different situation. So that British seventy thousand pounds becomes eighty seven thousand five hundred dollars. You divide that by four years, you get about I think it's eighteen hundred and twenty three per month or four hundred and fifty six dollars per week. Now, what I did here as well, if you do DCA, you does six Bitcoin from that GBP seventy thousand. Now, if you did DCAS, you'd have did ten Bitcoin. But I what I did was. I assumed if somebody wasn't going to college, they'd be working and they'd be able to save $200 a week. So over that total period, instead of spending 87,500 on Bitcoin, you'd be spending about $130,000. So that's an extra 10,000 inserted into Bitcoin per year for four years. That's how I get to 10 Bitcoin. And why 10 Bitcoin? Well, <laughs> I'll tell you in a second. But before we get there, let's talk about the quick summary of where we are. 20 pounds per month over four years. If we did this historically, 0 0.08 Bitcoin, again, not a spit in the bucket. DCAS, uh, 20 pounds a month would get you 0 0.1 Bitcoin. DCA, British pounds, 70,000 would get you six Bitcoin. And DCAS, 70,000 would get you 10 Bitcoin. If you include putting uh, additional money, 40,000 in, which is $200 a week part of your salary to pay for it. But why did I mention 10 Bitcoin? Because coincidentally, I believe there will never be more than 110,000 people that will ever own more than 10 Bitcoin. And that's going down all the time. And by the way, if there are any 10 coiners out there, keep your identity hidden because you'll be probably a target in the future. So I just want to mention one thing as well to wrap up here. I don't want to sound anti-university. There's lots of intangibles and cost of British universities far less than American uh, universities. But here there are certain things that are very, very important that you don't get without going to university. Personal development, social and communication skill development, networking. You know, I always say it's not who you are or it's not what you know, it's who you know. Uh, cultural awareness is also very important. Uh, personal organization and time management, too, is very important for people that have not been responsible for themselves. This is critical. And of course, independence, getting out of the home and learning about life. These are things that you can't put a value on. And therefore, I do believe education is very, very important for many reasons. But I also believe you can learn a lot yourself if you're driven. Uh, but some people need that structure. So, Sir Larry, a long-winded answer to your question, but I hope it helps. Uh, next one is from Elizabeth K. As the cosmos surrounding Bitcoin, ordinal, stack, sovereign, etc., is growing fast and being adopted, which position would you give these cosmos within the entire crypto market? Could Bitcoin become the financial layer one system embracing the entire world? So there's a lot to unpack here. So one of the things that I could do is value all of the layer twos on Bitcoin and see if we can identify a winner. I did that about a year, year and a half ago. And nothing was attractive to me, but that's typically me. I could, we'll talk about another asset in a minute as well. But let's look at how these things are growing. So by Cosmos, by the way, I assume you are referring to layer two surrounding Bitcoin and not the Cosmos atom chain. And you're correct. L2s are growing fast and being adopted, which is great to see. And there's been quite a lot of development around these layer twos. And they are quite exciting and they are quite competitive in the wider crypto market, which is important. And we do believe uh, these layer twos will hit across four key categories, payments, smart contracts, DeFi and NFTs. 
So watch this place. There is hope for them. So you're dead right. Second, let's dig into a couple of them. The most important layer two on Bitcoin is the Lightning Network. It is the biggest layer two and it's the most widely adopted crypto payment network. It's also the only payment network that's backed by a cryptocurrency that's recognized as legal tender after El Salvador officially recognized Bitcoin. Now, Lightning is a layer two built on top of Bitcoin. As you mentioned, I think there's about 37,000 nodes, 67,000 active channels, and uh, the total value of the network is worth about $58 million. And also it has some very uh, strong backers and proponents that are building on it, like Jack Dorsey with Cash App, Jack Muller with Strike, uh, no, Jack Muller's, sorry, Jack Muller's, and Adam Back uh, with Blockstream. So there's a lot of heavy hitters behind the scene. But there's more. Guess who just said something literally a few hours ago? And Coinbase CEO Brian Armstrong said, Lightning is great and something we all integrate. Uh, of course, Bitcoin Archive asks when, but uh, that was a positive thing, another feather in the cap of Lightning. Also, let's talk about smart contracts. Uh, for smart contracts, Bitcoin has Liquid Network. It's a federated sidechain for Bitcoin and allows issuance and transfer of digital assets using a two-way peg to the Bitcoin blockchain. And Liquid lets Bitcoin support smart contracts, just like Layer 1s, which we know and love. Uh, it also uses a technology called Elements, which allows DAP developers to build blockchain-based applications. And this lets users create and execute programmable contracts that can be automatically enforced through Liquid. And these contracts can be used to mint tokens, tokenize assets, facilitate atomic swaps, etc. And Liquid has grown quite a lot since its launch in 2018. It's been a gradual climb, but uh, its daily transaction volume now is about 20,000 20, transactions with a TVL of about half a billion dollars. So it's right up there uh, on a comparable basis to other layer twos. Now let's talk about DeFi. Sovereign, we've covered this before a couple of times. Uh, it's one of the most promising projects on Bitcoin layer two. It enables traders to lend, borrow, and earn interest on their Bitcoin. And it, Sovereign is a layer two that's built on top of RSK. It's a technology known as Rootstock to operate the sidechain that is interoperable with Bitcoin. Uh, the DeFi services I mentioned, uh, they're growing, lending, borrowing, yield farming, etc. And according to DeFi Pulse, Sovereign has $1.5 billion in TVL and it's experienced over 500% growth since 2022. And uh, I think Pomp is one of the investors as well in Sovereign. So uh, I did look at it and I will check it out again and see if anything has changed. Uh, let's talk about NFT and ordinals. Is one of the newest projects that's gained a lot of attention and uh, a lot of adoption of Bitcoin too. So if Metcalf's law works, they should drive up the value of the actual network. And this allows users to uh, create inscriptions, which inscribes data content to a Bitcoin transaction, effectively marking them a Satoshi with data. And this allows users to mint NFTs directly on the Bitcoin network and trade them on chain. And this is extremely exciting because it brings the NFT use case to the Bitcoin blockchain. And Ordinals only launched at the beginning of this year. And uh, now it's doing about 600,000 daily encryptions. In fact, if you're one of the concerns that people have is this could choke up the whole blockchain, but uh, I'm not too worried about that. And as you can see, Elizabeth, this is the Ordinal inscriptions, they are now consuming 50% of the Bitcoin block space. But uh, as you can see, the layer two ecosystem for Bitcoin is very vibrant, growing very fast, and uh, we can hope for more developments in this area. And that will truly be a decentralized, permissionless network to do a whole bunch of different stuff. So I am excited to see the growth in this area. So great question, Elizabeth Kay. Next question, uh, this is from CPK2001. I am a senior with some difficulty with tech, and I'm concerned about using Ledger and losing tokens. Due to health issues, I would prefer something like a soft wallet, like Exodus, MetaMask, etc. While not as secure, they may give me more peace of mind. Any suggestions for a few good wallets? This is a very important question for everybody. We stress wallet security, self-sovereignty all the time. So let's jump through this, and uh, thank you so much as well, CPK. For this brilliant question. First of all, we do thoroughly recommend a big shout out to Dr. W for helping me. He's our wallet expert on staff. Uh, I 
I hope you're okay and I hope you take care of your health. That's what I stress here as well for everybody. The future is exciting, so everybody stay healthy, okay? Number one priority, investing comes second. Um, but your health comes first. And any senior with health issues, you are right to be concerned about losing your tokens. By the way, another thing as well, just to reiterate, in case I forget, practice your OPSEC all the time. If you have a wallet, don't set it and forget it. Take it out once a month. Make sure you remember your PIN. Fire it up. Make sure it works. Transfer something. And you got to keep your skills sharp. So this is a very, very important thing as we go forward. So let's go back to multi-sig. A few things we suggest here for seniors or anybody with health issues or memory issues and wanting to pass crypto onto loved ones. First of all, multi-sig is a security feature that is available for most major wallets. Do not get a wallet that doesn't have multi-sig capabilities. And it requires multiple signatures to authorize the transaction. For example, you can configure multi-sig to require two-thirds of signatures with distinct private keys before a transaction can be executed. That means if one of the three of the private keys is lost, you can still use the other two private keys to move the crypto. So imagine there could be many ways to use this feature to provide security. Uh, for instance, you create a 2-3 multi-sig, you keep one for yourself, you give one to your loved one, and you seal one in your will. And if for some reason something happens, uh, your loved one could still access your crypto with their key and the key within your will, or it could be within a safe deposit box, etc. So multi-sig, very important. Number two is Unchained Capital. This is a custodian, and we don't push anything here, but uh, this is just an option and um, something to consider. And while you can simply give one key to a loved one and seal the other key, the other option would be use a multi-sig custodian to hold one of your keys. And this is a third-party service provider that can help you create the multi-sig and or hold one of the keys for you as a service. And uh, Unchained Capital, I think, is the leader here. Don't quote me on that, but there's many out there, but make sure you trust them as well. And since it takes two keys to unlock your Bitcoin, Unchained will never be able to move your coins. And then you could give one of the two remaining keys to a loved one or seal it in a will. And this way you'll become, you know, if anything ever happens, uh, your crypto can be retrieved. That is second way. The third way is wallets. And I know you are concerned about hardware wallets, but please, for a large amount of cryptos, you, you, it, the software hot wallet is not, not, not recommended. Um, but if you must use one, uh, please use one that has offline capability, i.e. hard wallet, not a hot wallet. Hard, <laughs> it's confusing. Hard, hard wallet, cold wallet. Okay, same category. Hot, hot, H-O-T, don't do for large amounts of crypto. Now, as we mentioned as well, most are multi-sig capable, so we do recommend that. And I do agree with you that Ledger can be complicated. It's very difficult to see. I can't even see the numbers on my Ledger wallet without using my phone or being in a very bright space. Uh, other wallets like Blockstream, Jade, uh, Trezor are all viable and simple to use. But if you prefer to use a software wallet, you mentioned Exodus, this is a good option, but keep in mind with a software wallet, you'll never be able to match the security of a hardware device. And if you're using a software wallet as your hot wallet for everyday cash, that is totally fine. Small amounts, but uh, big amounts again, if you can, cold wallet, hard wallet. And if you had to use a software wallet as cold storage solution, then make sure you have one that's offline capable, like Sparrow Wallet or Spectre, both fit that bill. Okay, so a lot to unpack there. Get a pen and paper, take everything we said. Uh, I'll, I'll share this as well within Patreon so everybody can see it later too. Um, thank you for your question. <laughs> Next question is from Chat BTC. Chat Bitcoin, I love that name. It's like Chat GPT. And uh, so here we are. So why is Polkadot performing the way it has over the last few months? And does it have a real future? With the developer activity, but lack of daily active users, it seems like a PRC real estate project. I assume that means People's Republic of China. And the parachains appear to be more of a gimmick. Uh, should I jump on a faster horse? NFA. So let's 
dig into Polkadot. Polkadot has been one of those enigmas. You know, they've got a huge amount of development happening, but it's kind of gone nowhere for a long time. And there was some weird things happening within the organization. But let's look just at a quant uh, here, as we do on this channel. So I pulled up the total uh, of all the layer one, layer two smart contract platforms. And we score them. Uh, first of all, if you look at the SCP compendium score, Polkadot doesn't do too bad. You can see it's close to the top. Um, and the average score for all of the smart contract platforms, which is nearly 40 of them or more, uh, the average score is 4.5. Polkadot has a score of 7.6. And it is in the top five of these platforms. Now let's look at Polkadot SCP ranking itself. This is, so the, for, first of all, let me explain so people don't miss this. Um, this is the compendium score. This looks at tokenomics, everybody. The second one is what we call our SCP profiler. This looks at all the facets and features of a smart contract platform. Now here you can see Polkadot ranks number 10 out of uh, all of the top players, which is not that good. So that is a little bit of a concern. Let's look at development versus adoption because you did hit on something and you were totally correct chat BTC. Now this is the, uh, we look at a whole bunch of scores and rankings across about 69 different parameters. And here, blue is the development score. And you can see Polkadot has an incredibly good score when compared to the rest. But adoption is in the toilet. It is flatlined again, along with many others. It is critical, absolutely critical for a chain like a mall to have customers. No adoption, you get the best technology in the world if it's not adopted, you're wasting your time. And that is the predicament that Polkadot is in right now. Again, really good tokenomics, not too good a SCP score for many different reasons. And here, adoption is nowhere to be seen. So in summary, this is, and I always have to be very careful because I don't want to call anybody's token not pretty or whatever, but a quick, quick and dirty summary here. And uh, the chart, I, I won't look at the chart because it looks like many others is just kind of flatlined for the last while. And the tokenomics are solid. Development score is solid. SCP is number 10 out of 20. Beyond the top 20, they're just ghost chains that'll never go anywhere. And the real issue is adoption. But the key message here is, I do believe, it's very important, I do believe there is no room for 20 layer ones on earth. There will be kind of point layer ones that have a very specific purpose and there'll be the top two or three that do all the business. Okay. Be on the top two or three. Don't be out number 10 unless, and this is the last piece here, crypto is not loyal. And we've seen how some chains will gradually wither away, but some can explode and flourish unexpectedly. I don't know if Polkadot's going to be one of those. I don't know if some of their subchains will be very successful. We can't tell. But what I have seen is users are fickle. And if they have a value proposition product market fit that's second to none, whew, millions of users could go overnight. And that's what we don't know. So again, I talk about black holes, best, cheapest, fastest, best UX, best experience, most users, most volume. That's where people will go. I don't know what Polkadot's going to do. And in full disclosure, uh, I don't own any. So I hope that helps. Um, next question is from Siddhartha. Do you think the bull market that gets us back to S&P 4700 level will be gradual or as sudden, like a melt up as the crash was? And if it's gradual, does this mean it's less risky to be in and out of the market since moves aren't so vicious? Excellent question. I think about this all the time. First of all, 2023 will be a trader's market. There will be huge volatility. And you remember, you may remember my video from the 5th or 6th of January. First five days, first five trading days of January are critical. And this takes me to this chart here. And uh, I have this in an old version. I couldn't find it on my spreadsheet, but hat tip to Tom Lee for putting this together. Uh, and he also looks at the history of markets 
going back 75 years. Now, the whole point of this is, first of all, the, the annual performance and the first quarter performance and the first five day performance and the first month performance is very indicative of what the stock market does in that year. If history repeats, remember the most dangerous words in investing is this time is different. Well, it has proven to be very good so far. First five days were bonkers. And since then, the first Q1 was out of control. Um, but there are a little a few problems which I'll talk about as well in a minute. So what about April? Let's talk about April first. Uh, April typically is the strongest month of the year, especially with this type of historical setup. And it mainly relies on the rule of the first five days. And here, uh, the S&P 500 gained 1.4% in the first five days. And it was negative in the prior year. And this has only happened seven times. 1950, 1958, 1963, 1967, 1975, 2003, 2012, and 2019. And typically, we could get 4% return. But so far, this month has been a bit rocky. Now, if, if, if we go back, actually, to answer your question, go back to this chart here. If you look at what happens in July, August, September... They are kind of the weak, weak months and historically that's the same. May sometimes is crap uh, because of other history. You know, I covered the other day, sell in May, go away, come back in September, October. That's what history tells you here from this chart too. So if you imagine the year, Q1, bonkers, April is supposed to be pretty good. After that, weakness, summer, flat line, and then autumn, fall, whatever you want to call it, goes bonkers. Let's look at what people talk about, and it may sound crazy, but a lot of people see this as the new bull run. Uh, we've been up since October 12th, 2022. And per that little line there, crossing up, being above the 200-day moving average is a very positive sign. And this means that April, we could get above 4,200. Who knows? There are a lot of macro headwinds. A lot of uncertainty now with saber rattling in China and Taiwan, etc. So let's summarize on what I think is the best strategy, Siddhartha. So it does defy belief, but the S&P 500 is up 7% year to date. But the top eight stocks made all of those gains. The other 492 have been pretty much flat. April typically is the best month with this historical setup. We've gone through a banking crisis. I do believe there's more shoes to drop. But the market's brushing it off, which is quite astounding. Earnings as well are not as bad as many had forecast. And inflation is coming down, no ifs, ands, or buts, except for oil is the wild card there. If oil goes back to $80, $90, $100 real quick, uh, we're in trouble. I think it was at 80 last time I checked. Uh, and the market's brushing all this off. So historical probabilities favor S&P 500 hitting 4,700 in 2023. Remember the dollar's debasing. That's what this thing is measured in, but it's definitely a trader's market. I think we could hit 47 at some stage. We hit 4,200 already. It's not a big stretch to get back up there, but it'll be very, very choppy and watch for the summer. So I hope that helps. Um, again, I don't have a crystal ball, but I do study history. Next, uh, from Chewy. After Tesla, what are your top five biggest equity positions and any you wish to increase or decrease in the coming weeks? So, uh, yes. Good question. So first of all, for those who don't know me, I tend to have very, very high conviction in very few names. I am not somebody that owns a little piece of 60 things because mathematics says that's not a way to win. You've got to identify winners, get in early, get in hard. Okay, that's critical. Next, uh, these are my top five equity positions after Tesla. But remember, Tesla's like 80% of this bag. The other 20% is split across these. And let me explain how and why. First of all, Google. It's a long position I've had for a very long time. I got into Google 20 years ago. And I just have some legacy stock kicking around. I sell calls against it on spikes and just keep it there as a kind of a safety egg. Also, because I believe in AI names, uh, that's one of the reasons I'm still holding Google. I was very tempted, in full disclosure, very tempted uh, late last year, early this year, to ditch it for NVIDIA. But then, um, you know, there'd be a big tax bill and stuff, but that's okay. But I didn't do it. That was a mistake because NVIDIA went bonkers. But over the last couple of days, 
think Thursday, uh, Google had a great day in the stock market. My number two position is a synthetic long, which means I sold a put to buy a call on NVIDIA, big position. Uh, Meta, huge position, uh, which has grown very big. I did the same thing when it was down in the 90s. Sold a put to buy a call, that did very well. I did hedge it. That was kind of a mistake because I left some money on the table, but you don't, you know, hedging means you cover yourself in case it dips. It didn't dip, it kept on going up. So I had to buy that back, but I'm still long the synthetic long. MicroStrategy, big synthetic long position as well. And Trade Desk, stock. Um, I had a synthetic long on Trade Desk, which converted into stock and I'm still holding because I'm still very positive on the outlook for that particular company. So Chewy, hope that helps. Uh, next question, um, Max1, you speak about the likelihood of AI out trading humans three years from now. What's the end game? And if every trader has access to the same free AI trading tools, won't all trading activity in the market cancel each other out? And what will decide trader AI outsmarts the competition? There's a lot of stuff to this and let me kind of walk through and there's a silver lining at the end. So hold on tight. It's not the end of the world, but it did alarm many people. First of all, the way we build models, we analyze a ton of data to be able to make decisions and AI powered trading systems have already with their absolutely mind blowing ability to rapidly crunch numbers, look at data is staggering. And that is my concern. It's so shown the most incredible progress just this year to date. And AI power trading systems have already demonstrated remarkable success in financial markets. A huge amount of trading is happening using algos and bots. That's my concern. Uh, also capabilities are evolving very fast and AI is far more capable to analyze data uh, data processing, analysis, risk management, decision making than a human mind ever could. That is my concern because that's what I've, I've done for a long time. Look at large numbers of data and try find patterns and opportunities. And that's what I'm concerned about. So again, a human will never ever be able to catch up with what these things can do. And the question is if they have somebody orchestrating how the AI works, pointed to the right data to make the right decisions, that's what I'm afraid of, because that will take away our edge. Uh, in addition, this is a famous old saying, hope for the best, but prepare for the worst and be unsurprised by anything in between. So uh, I'm an optimistic guy, but I'm also risk averse and very cautious. So I'd rather have people be fearful of things like AI taking away, you know, excess gains in the market, because that's what we do on the trading side. But this is most important. There, as you know, I'm kind of 80% build a huddle bag using DCAS and other types of tools. And I swap in and out of these as things change, as narratives change. Some things I hold for a very long time, like Google, like Bitcoin, etc. But this is the silver lining we have. And I always say, do your homework, get in early, get in hard. Another way of saying this is identify winners early and invest heavily in them. And that will be a valid strategy for many investors, particularly those who have high risk tolerance and can handle the volatility. So, so important. So getting in things like, like Tesla, when I first got into Tesla, have a bit of mentioned the Tesla name, that was a huge risk. The company could have gone bankrupt and it nearly did, but it pays off. And that's what I mean about identifying things that are special, get in early, get in hard, and then stomach the volatility. Same thing with Bitcoin, stomach the volatility. That is the silver lining we have. I think we are focused very heavily on having tools and building tools to give us the edge, see things that bots can't, and we'll continue to work on that. But I don't know if it's going to be two years, three years, five years, but analyzing data, finding what I like to do is finding ARB opportunities between pairs will become harder and harder and harder as we go forward. No doubt about that. And uh, some happy news, best part of the week, helping animals. Uh, this week we donated to Best Friends to help support the care, food, shelter, and medical for the following animals. IHOP loves cuddling and making new friends, including cats and dogs. Very cute bunny. Saw one this morning here in the garden. And Gobi needs long-term medical care and is unable to be released or adopted. So thank you all for making this possible. Hope you enjoyed the Q&A today. Hope everybody's doing well out there. And I'm gonna do some questions 
as Bitcoin, it just hit 28.2, but boy, has it been so quiet over the last week or so. Just, but it'll, it'll jump up or down or some way. And what it's done has been quite incredible. So happy birthday, TMD Tesla. Thank you for all you do. It's amazing, uh, amazing. So thank you so much. Uh, let's, oh, Mike, how are you, buddy? Happy Easter, I team. For the others, appreciate you, sir. Hope all is well. Be careful out there on the road as well. If you're driving El Conquistador, Bitcoin is up $500 since James Live started. You should do more lives. I love that. I did see it move. I have a, a ticker on my left here, and I did see it pop. Um, but that's that's insane. But it's just the, the thing, you know, I, I talk about kind of trading. What's happening now with Bitcoin, it's the trader's market. Okay, they're manipulating it and they're playing that little $800, $600 range. So that's why you see it going up and down. It's got to break out above that 28.6 and stay there for it to be a new era. Who knows when that'll happen? Valstrax plays Teppin. I would trade my degrees back then for any amount of Bitcoin. Biggest waste of my life. It was me testing my own intelligence and I failed that test. That being said, it was the most valuable lesson I've ever paid for. Sometimes, and this is a very good point, I made a mistake when I was very young. I was about 21, 22 years of age. And that changed me. I, I lost on a big, I made a lot of money on trade and I got really greedy and borrowed money to invest more because I thought I had God's gift. And that loss made me hate losing. So if ever I make a mistake, I make sure I don't make it twice. So you're, you may say you failed the test. No, you learned a valuable lesson. So keep up the good work and you're in the right place too. And you've been here for a long time because I remember your name. You're an OG from two years ago. Uh, Felix Silver, I'm new here. What is your thesis behind the dollar debasement uh, you're projecting? So uh, Felix Silver, uh, it's all fiat is garbage. The world is built on a mountain of debt. And as they do things like increase rates, the debt servicing costs go out of control. Um, if you're in the community, I made a big post yesterday regarding pensions. Very, very long-winded. Looked at France, Chicago, United States. And that kind of talks to exactly what the problem is. The problem we have, if you imagine, imagine there being 1 billion US dollars in the world, and then they add 20% of that 1 billion US dollars. The amount of debasement from that additional 20% extra dollars over time becomes 20%. And that's the problem. That's why basically we lose on average all fiats 14% on average per year. That's why many years, you know, stock markets go up, etc. Um, now the question is, is the dollar going to accelerate in its debasement? Well, right now, I think nearly 25% of the total federal budget will have to go towards interest payments. And the debt's only going to explode. It's never going to get smaller. It's going to get bigger. Interest payments will get bigger. And money printing will continue. That's why we need hard assets. That's what we preach here. So it's all about money printing. QE to infinity, whatever you want to call it, it's never, ever going to stop. Debt limits will have to continue to be raised um, as the debt explodes. Interest in the debt explodes. Deficits explode. More money printing happens. It's just... If you're stuck, there's nothing they can do. There's nothing they can do at all. So we just sit back and watch and make sure we're not holding dollars long term. Uh, that's the most important. Um, and welcome, Felix. Dax Rico, I, it would be interesting to know if you're still a fan of CleanSpark. Uh, a lot of people want me to do another minor video this week. I will do that. Um, I have analyzed CleanSpark six times over the last year plus. It is the most effective, most efficient miner out there, no matter which way you skin it. The problem, and I had the CEO on the channel, the problem is dilution. I don't know how much stock they're going to issue. That's my concern. That being said, I'm trying to calculate how much Bitcoin they need to mine to overcome the stock dilution and also calculate the lag between issuing shares, buying rigs and plugging them in. That's the magic that I need to do. And I will do it this week uh, for you, Dax. Thank you, Mr. Keyframes. 
Can you discuss what the concern of Steve Wozniak, Elon Musk, and 50 other visionaries visionaries are when it comes to AI? And what are their concerns about AI? It's real simple. They're afraid that the machine is kind of like a, a movie with the Terminator. The machine will get smarter and smarter and smarter and be able to just take over everything. Uh, and that is their concern. And the the pace of development and knowledge of the AI we have, even though it's still very crude, it's very early days, they're building the stepping stones for this thing to learn itself. And that's the problem, that whole AGI concern. And that's what these people are worried about. And they're dead right. I, w- I wouldn't be too concerned about Steve Wozniak, but when Elon Musk shares his concern, you know, and he is he probably runs the top AI company on earth. Some people call it a car company. I call it an AI company. Um, that is that is the real concern. So, at what point can the machines connect to each other and make decisions for themselves to shut down the rest of the world? That's their concern. I think there was also a test of AI. You know, what it would do in certain situations. For example, if there's one person tied to a track on one side and five people on the other side, which way would the AI train go, left or right? And I think, I can't remember what it was. It was like, instead of hitting the brakes, it would go left and kill one person instead of killing five people and not think about it. And that's that's the judgment call that they're very concerned about. And thank you for your super sticker, KN Viciously and Jeff Hammer. Good to see you out there, Jeff. Happy Easter. And JKS, um, with the economy looking so bad, is it better to stack cash for the next two quarters or continue to DCA into my bags of Bitcoin and Tesla? So I've been saying for a long time, there are certain things that are recession proof. I think despite the global recession, everybody knows it's here. But by the time the government says we're in a recession, we're actually out of it or coming out of it. And the stock market is long bottomed. Um, So from that perspective, if you're in a winning asset, that's not vulnerable. Like if you look at the price action of gold today uh, versus Bitcoin versus the stock market, gold and Bitcoin are correlated. And the, I think Bitcoin has had the weakest NASDAQ correlation in three years, which is outstanding. So these two flight to safety assets, Bitcoin and gold, are going up. Uh, and then the winning names within the stock market are going up. The rest is flat. So from that perspective, I think the summer will be bumpy. I think there'll be some great buying opportunities. Stock some cash. It's never good to be 100% cash, but keep like 7, 10, 15, 20% cash if you can. I'm ready to get some good names if there is that dip. Uh, I'll be there with my finger on the trigger and let you guys know what I believe is a good thing uh, to buy at that point in time. But um, again, remember, uh, just as I mentioned earlier in the video, it may look dark and gloomy, but the stock market over time goes up. Earnings aren't as bad. Money printing will continue. There's a lot more liquidity in the world as well today printed by other economies, that's actually driving price of risk assets up too. So JKS, hope that helps. Um, And any expert will tell you it's never good to be out of the market unless you can time the market perfectly, move the cash without incurring big tax liabilities and jump back in at the right time. And that's very, very difficult to do. Um, And thank you for your super sticker, Quincy. Happy Easter all, happy weekend, happy Sunday, wherever you are in the world, whatever you practice, DCA will be on tomorrow. And I don't know which channel it is either. I'm not sure if Ran is back from vacation. Uh, If not, it'll probably be on my channel, but we'll find out. Okay, so thank you, everybody. Have a great evening. Bye.